So in English, hello everybody. Uh, welcome you to my uh, welcome. I, I would like to welcome you to my Java exploitation talk. Um, I called it Risa, recent Java exploitation techniques. Uh, recent because I mean in the last two years there are a couple of things going around in the Java exploitation scene. Um, I won't show you any zero days. I don't have any for Java currently, uh, but um, still I want to show you some, yeah. Example exploits, and based on that, I want to uh, illustrate you how the JVM is working, uh, especially the uh, security architecture of the JVM. Okay, before we start, um, I would like to introduce, introduce myself. Um, yeah, I'm Matthias. Um, my Twitter name is Matthias underscore Kaiser. I'm working as a lead expert, uh, offensive security at Dino TSS. Uh, our team is called Offensive Security because we are doing offensive security, and um, that means we are having fun uh, with the whole Daimler playground, with the whole Daimler uh, IT infrastructure. We're doing a lot of penetration testing uh, for Daimler. Um, I'm working for a small subsidiary of Daimler small daughter company, it's called Daimler TSS. We have about 500 uh, employees. We're working in Ulm and Stuttgart, and our secu offensive security team has about, let's say, 16 members. So I'm doing offensive security for four years now. Um, in the past, I was working for EADS as a Java dev, Java system architect, and also security architect. So Java exploitation is more a hobby for me. Um, yeah, I do pen testing, wound research, and I found uh, one bug in the Java JVM or an Oracle JRE, and also some bugs in SAP. By the way, SAP is easy, so you, you can find a lot of bugs there. Um, agenda for today. Um, first of all, I want to give you an overview of the Java exploitation or about the Java vulnerabilities from 2003 uh, till now. It's just a short overview, just to summarize what has happened 10 years now. Um, then I want to give you an introduction to the uh, Java Sandbox security. Um, afterwards, I want to illustrate you or show you the, the trusting method chaining. It's a specific exploitation or vulner vulnerability uh, based on the Pwn to own exploit of James Forshaw. Uh, and afterwards, I want to show you a short example of the reflection API abuse. Um, it's the vulner vulnerability uh, atom of security um, explorations found, I think, in 2012, or one of the 50 or 60 vulnerabilities Adam found. Um, but this is a shorter example. And later on, so the last thing is just to show you the recent advances in Java security. They introduced click to play. And uh, there were about two bypasses right now to get around this click to play feature. And I also want to show how the click to play is currently bypassed. OK. Let's have a look um, what has happen happened from 2000, uh, 2010 to uh, 2003 to uh, 2013. So in the past, we had a lot of memory corruptions in Java. So um, I mean, Java has a sandbox. You do not have any native code, or you do not program any uh, native code. You have managed code, but still you have native interfaces. You have the Java native interface. And especially there, a lot of vulnerabilities were found in the past. Um, the typical guys who found uh, this vulnerabilities were Regenrecht, Pop. So working for ZEI, also this guy working with ZEI, um, Peter from Exodus, and also Joshua J. Drag from Acumant. Um, there were a lot of argument injections in the Java JIE. Um, I think the, well, the most, most known one is the one from Tavis um, by adding this alt JVM property. Uh, Chris Rees found a lot of vulnerabilities by using yeah, argument injections, especially in WebStart. Um, and he, he was also working with uh, the Zero Day Initiative. And I also found a vulnerability based on argument injection, also WebStart, and also working with ZDI. So from 2008 till now, a lot of things changed. Um, there were new 
Um, there were new vulnerability classes discovered. So I think in 2008, uh, Semi Koivu, I, I hopefully I pronounce him uh, correctly, found um, the privileged um, deserialization uh, attack. Um, his bug um, is very well known in the Java security scene. It's called the calendar bug, and he also found uh, several other bugs based on privileged deserialization. Uh, but I think the most interesting one is the trusted method chaining. It's a, a vulnerability class on its own. And also Semi discovered this vulnerability class and Michael Schiel, also from Germany, um, found the famous Reno or Rhino vulnerability and at Pwn2013, uh, James Walter from uh, Context Security um, um, showed, uh, showed also a zero day based on trusted method chaining. And to the uh, beginning of 2012, um, I think there was a, a huge, a huge step in the um, sec Java security scene because uh, security explorations um, discovered about 60 vulnerabilities in the um, in the Java JRE. Um, Adam did a great job, and if you want to see the exploits, you can just go on his web page. It's ex uh, ex um, security explorations. Just download them, try them out, it's great. You learn a lot. Um, also the guy from Immunity, he discovered some uh, vulner uh, vulnerabilities based on core API abuses. And recently, Ben Murphy, he also had a zero day for the pwn to own contest. Um, is, he has also already found a lot of vulnerability based on core API abuses. And recently, um, this guy from, I think, Holland, uh, or from the Netherlands, um, he has discovered several type confusions. Um, I think he's the main developer of akvm.net, so it's a virtual machine. Uh, and he's very deep in bytecode. He found several interesting uh, um, type confusions, which are really easy to exploit. And there's also a public exploit. Uh, it's for Java 721, as far as I know. OK. So let's start with the Java sandbox security. So uh, as I heard from <coughs> Markus, you all know Java. So you all can write Java code. Is it true? Yes. OK. So in Java, you can write interfaces and classes. Usually you write classes. And um, you have fields and methods. You all know this. You have the access modifiers like public, public, private, uh, protected, and package private, and so on. Package private is very interesting because if you have a package, a package private field, only the visibility scope is within the package. And I think the rest is clear also from C++. So core security components of the JVM. So the components which are, let's say, really interesting for, for writing Java exploits. First of all, you have the JVM runtime. It's written in C, so it's a, it's a, a JVM. Um, hotspot, for example, is one. Uh, you have the runtime classes. If you look in your uh, JDK or JAE folder, C program files, JDK or JRE, there's under, under the lib folder, there's a rt.char. There you find all the core classes, for example, Java lang class, Java lang whatever, Java lang object, whatever you want. Everything is in rt.char. You have class loaders. Um, class loaders, uh, or the class loader class, is a specific class. If you initiate, uh, if you instance, if you have instances of uh, class loaders, you can load classes into the JVM. Um, you have the several cl uh, class loaders. I will. I will show you later on, uh, but class loaders are security critical. Just just a note: if you are able to uh, uh, if you are able to create your own class loader, it's a checkpot. If you can do this, it's a checkpot. You have the bytecode verifier because Java is compiled into bytecode, and the bytecode verifier verifies if the code is valid. It makes some type integrity checks and so on. There were also some interesting bugs in the bytecode verifier. 
uh, recently, but I won't show it here. Um, the most, most obvious classes, um, security manager and access controller. The security manager is very interesting. Whenever you want to have higher privileges into the JVM, the security managers ask, can I open a file and so on? And he will decide if you can do or not. And what a security manager is do, uh, doing, he's just forwarding all the checks to the access controller, we will see later on. <coughs> And you, then you have the garbage collector. So, class loaders. Very interesting. Um, the class loaders load classes into the JVM. Um, and the first class loader, which you have, is the null class loader, the bootstrap class loader. This class loader is written in C. And for example, the rt.char, all classes in the rt.char file, like Java Lang object and so on, all the classes you're usually using for writing applets or web start applications, they are located in the rt.char and they are, they are loaded with the um, null class loader or bootstrap class loader. Um, so if you have a class loader, it usually inherits from Java Lang class loader. When the JVM is started, for example, if you have a Java applet, the bootstrap class loader comes into the game, then the extension class loader, then the system class loader, and then the applet class loader. Which means if you if you're running a Java applet, all the code is all your code is running in the applet class loader. So there's a specific name for that. Um, Sun whatever applet two class loader, I think so, but it doesn't matter right now. Um, and the class loaders are all chained. For example, if you're trying to load a class, or if you're trying to, to, to instance an object from your class, the class loader from the applet is asked, can you load this class? And the applet class loader decides, okay, yeah, okay, this is one of my classes, I can load them. And if not, for example, if you want to load a, a system class, he's delegating the class loading process to the, um, to the upper class loader. For example, if you're loading a class from, R, uh, if you want to instate an object from a class of rt.char, then the bootstrap class loader is usually involved. But there are also other mechanisms. Um, the most interesting um, method of the class loader for exploitation is the define class method. Because with this, cla uh, with this method, you can um, define your own Java classes in a VM. And just a note, if you can define your own class, you can add the class your own permissions. For example, if you're, if you're loading your class and you define the, that this class has all permissions, you can do everything in the JVM. So for example, the goal of an exploiter is to, to get a class loader, call the define class under privilege context, define his own class, get the class running, or get an object inst uh, created, and then get the code running to disable the security manager. Uh, yeah, and I already said rt.char is uh, all classes from rt.char are loaded by the bootstrap class loader. Bytecode verifier. Um, bytecode verifier. Um, the bytecode verifier verifies the bytecode, makes type integrity checks, and so on. Um, yeah, I think that's okay. Um, the bytecode verifier checks for valid, for valid classes because bytecode, I mean, what is bytecode? If you load a class from file system, you have only bytecode, the bytes are passed, and then checked if it is a valid class. And there's also a public class file format. You can download it from, from Sun or Oracle. Um, how a class looks like, so where the byte structure. Uh, and the bytecode verifier makes the integrity checks. For example, if you want, want to cast an, an object to another object, and this would be a dangerous operation, the bytecode verifier would, would also find this hopefully uh, through static analysis. The security manager. <coughs> the security manager. Let's do it a little bit different. The security manager. Oh. Oh. Not working. 
forth. Mm, okay. Security manager. That's a different wrong one. The security manager is always asked if you want to do a sensitive operation. For example, if you want to access a file, um, then the specific class will check based on the security manager check method if you are allowed to read a file. You have something like check exec for check execute. So if you want to do something like codex, uh, uh, runtime get runtime dot x exe uh, and execute an operating system command, you can can be sure that at that point where the command is executed, before that you can find something like a check exec or similar. Or if you want to delete a file or read a file and so on, um, the Java code, so the classes from rt.java will check check this. So back to the PowerPoint. Um, the security manager, mm, if you, if, if you have ever programmed Java and you wanted to get something, some information about your system or your environment, you have something like the system class, java.lang.system. And there's a field called security manager in this class. If you can override this field, you can disable the, band, uh, the sandbox. So, or if you can call the method uh, security manage, uh, Java lang system dot set security manager if you can call it with the null parameter the sandbox is disabled we will see it later on <coughs> and that's usually the ultimate goal disable the security manager um, yeah the checks are based on permissions so the security manager what he's doing if you want to open a file he's checking in the sandbox environment you have the privileges for that, he will uh, ask the access controller, and the access controller is using a specific mechanism for that. And here's a short list again for the, for the methods. So whenever you want to open a socket, one of the methods is called in order to verify if you have the privileges. Um, so the access controller, and now we're getting a little bit deeper, um, is checking the current uh, current access control context. And the access control context is an abstraction for what privileges you have. Um, and what he's doing is, this, this object or this class, um, he's checking if only trusted code is on the stack. Your code coming from a, from a non, um, um, non, or let's say, non-privileged class loader, if you have code on the stack, if your method is running, it's non-privileged uh, non marked, so it won't, it won't run. And the access control is always checking the whole stack, so the whole method call stack, if only trusted code is on the stack. If not, you don't have any permissions. Um, the access controller has a method called do privileged. And if you look into our t.char, into classes of it, we will see it later on, um, you always find something like do privileged and then a code block. And in this code block, privileged operations are implemented. If you augment file, for example, you find something like a do privileged. If you try to execute a command, you find something like a do privileged at a lot of places. <coughs> this is, and if you want to write an exploit, and want to disable the security manager, for example, usually what you do is you do also something like a do privilege block, and in this do uh, privilege block, you do something like disable, uh, calling uh, system dot set security manager now. And here's an example. I think it's from Oracle. So here we want to load a native library, so something like avt.dll, avt.so, and native library loading is a sensitive operation. You need privileges for that. In order to do that in the JVM, you need to call the access controller, the do privileged, define a code block, 
where you run this code. And if you have the rights or permissions for that, then the code will execute it. And if the sandbox is enabled, and, and if you do not have any privileges, it shouldn't work. If you have the privileges, it should work. So, and if you want, if you want to see how this algorith uh, algorithm works, you can look at the Java source code, uh, what he's doing. He's looking at the whole method stack. We will see, I think we will also see it in the next slides. He will look at the whole method call stack and starting from the, from the bottom going up and check for every method call, for every class, if this class is privileged or not. And if not, you don't have any, you don't have the permission or, or for every, for, no. He's going from the bottom to the up and checking for every frame on the stack if this frame or if this class has the permission to do that. Okay, so here is an, a good example from the secure coding guidelines from Oracle. We have the app class, we have a main method, we have a system out printle, uh, and we are calling um, the static method get options of lib class. And what lib class does is getting a system property, for example, if it is Windows or not. And if you look at the call stack, you see, okay, main is here, get option is here, get property is here. And if you want to read a property from the JVM, the, uh, a permission is checked if, you can, uh, if you're allowed to. And if you have the permission, then it will be executed. And for checking the permission, the access controller is involved and he will check if all these classes, which are, or all these method which are on the stack have the privileges to do that. And if you would run this code in the sandbox environment, so in an applet, it won't work because you do not have the privilege. Uh, usually not. There are some, some properties where you, can do, uh, where you can read, but not all. Um, with the access controller do privilege block, um, you can can uh, get the access controller to, to or you can mark code on the stack. And to do that, the access controller will check by inspecting the stack if something like a do privilege block is there. And if the do privilege block is there, then just the immediate caller will be checked if this guy has the permission to do this privilege operation. And if he has, the, code, uh, the access controller will say, okay, that's fine. And if not, not, but other classes will not be checked. So just the immediate caller. In this example, if you go there, if you would have something like the do privilege block here for a system get property, only the immediate caller will be checked. And the immediate caller is this class, this method. So I think you all know the slogan, write once, run everywhere. Um, the cool thing about Java exploits is write once, exploit anywhere. Um, I mean, it's, it's true. If you're looking at all the <coughs> Java exploits you can find currently in the wild or wherever, they run on every platform. You can run them on Windows, on Linux, you can run them on Mac, um, as long as it is managed code. Um, there are also a lot of uh, native interface exploits. That's not that easy. You have to adjust it for the specific platform. OK, trusted method chaining. Um, trusted method chaining is a specific exploitation or a specific vulnerability class, and I think also an exploitation technique. Um, this technique was discovered by Semi Koivu. Uh, he's from, fin uh, from Finland and he's working with Oracle currently. Um, so he's trying to get all the bugs out of Java and I think it's a pretty tough job currently. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that he will work with Adam a lot uh, from security exploration currently because he does find so many bugs. Um, trusted method chaining um, was, let's say, 
firstly uh, first or uh, shown in the first public exploit in CVE 2010 8, uh, 840 um, and it affected one Java 1.4 uh, to Java 1.6 it was a really interesting vulnerability. Um, I found the information on his blog. He also wrote down how you could exploit it. And at the time, I was really amazed how this was working. Uh, I also wrote for, for this CVE the Metasploit module. You can find it in Metasploit. And it's really, whenever I see it running, it's always crazy because it's such, uh, such a magic. Um, for this specific CVE, or also for the vulnerability class, um, Semi got the Pony Award for the best client side bug. Um, Michael Schiel, also from Germany, I think he's living in the area of um, Augsburg. Um, he also found a very interesting trusted method chaining bug. It's called the Reno or Rhino vulnerability, and it was also used very often in the Java exploits you can find in the world. And that Pwn to own, two, uh, 2013, James Warshaw showed also a trusted method chaining bug um, against Java 7. And what he was doing, he was, let's say, getting around the fix for, for this bug. He's getting around. So what did Sammy discover at that time? What is it, trusted method chaining? Uh, I found a very good explanation or definition in the security explorations paper. Um, maybe I'll show it to you. <coughs> uh, I mean, I think in this, in this paper, security vulnerabilities in Java SE, you find everything which is needed to understand. Um, there's a nice definition. In a case when an unprivileged class inherits from a privileged one and the class does not overload the method that is to be called and that is pushed on the call stack, this will be the privileged class that will be subject of the permission stack, not an untrusted class. An example, if you, if you have a system class, let's say set, hash set, like a set where you store st stuff in it and you, and you overload it, a method on it, and, uh, if, and if you subclass it with your own class, and you do not change, or if you do not overwrite the a method, but maybe implement an in interface, then you won't define any own code, and thus the permissions from the sub uh, from the father class or from the, uh, from the parent class will, will be the permissions. And how it works? Okay, already told it to you. So, and the goal is fi to find interesting classes um, in the RT, where you can find this nice combination where you have subclass a class, maybe implement an interface, for example, and then get the, the interface method executed by a trusted thread, like the RVT, uh, AVT event thread, which is doing all the uh, GUI rendering. Um, and how it works in detail, we'll see in the, next, in, in the first exploit. So time for the pwn to own exploit. It's CVE 2013-1488. Um, James Forshaw demonstrated, and as far as I remember, at Pwn to Own, there were three who showed zero days. It was James, it was Ben Murphy, and it was JDAG. JDAG used uh, native code, so memory corruption. So um, James exploited this vulnerability in two steps in uh, Pwn to Own. Uh, in the first step, he was able uh, to load and initiate a class under a privileged context, let's say under, under higher rights, using a trusted chain. And using this class or the object of this class, he was able to construct another 
trusted method chain, which was based on the exploitation technique of Michael Scheel, and got this trusted method chain executed, got the security manager disabled, and so on. Let's look at the vulnerability. And we will do it in Eclipse. Oh. So the class, which is affected, is driver manager. And we have the method, where is it? Load initial drivers. Uh, hopefully you can see it there and read. Uh, let me double check. Um, and the vulnerability, which, uh, which James exploited, is that you here have something like a do privilege block here. So this is code which is running under, um, under, higher, con uh, under higher permissions. And in this code, what is, what ha what is happening is that some, some classes of your jar file, of your applet, are loaded and objects created. And later on, an iterator is used to iterate over the newly created objects. And what is happening here is for all objects which are created, so-called drivers, um, the next method is called, and the printle method together it is concatenated, and the two-string method is called here because you have a printle. So, and this is always executed, this code. So what is happening here is print, print on this and also get the driver which is loaded, calling the next method, and then the two-string method because you have a print line. Uh, and usually this driver manager class is used for loading JDBC classes. So JDBC classes are classes which you usually use to get access to a database, to Oracle, Postgres, whatever you want. Um, but he's using this class to load his own code. And to do that, he's using this nice driver manager facility. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Um, uh, this uh, nice service loader facility and uh, the service loader is an abstraction, a, a new framework, uh, which what it does is you specify in your char file in, in the meta inf directory uh, which classes should be loaded and the service loader will load them. We can see it here. Uh, fake driver and you, we got the meta inf directory. So this is all the content of your char file, of your applet. It's exploit.class, fake driver.class, fake driver2.class, and also the meta inf directory, the services, and under the services you find text files. Uh, and in this text files, you write down which JDBC drivers should be loaded. Uh, loaded. Um, but what James did was not to define a class which is a JDBC driver, or not a real JDBC driver, but other classes. For example, Reno script engine and also Java SQL driver, uh, you know, the script engine. And for the Java SQL drivers, he was specifying that he, is in, he has developed own drivers, which are called fake driver one and fake driver two. And in fact, there are, no, there are not any drivers. They do not connect to any database. They're just implementation of this JDBC driver class. For example, this is the implementation. Implements Java SQL driver. Every class which is in SQL driver needs to implement this interface. What he also did, and this is very, uh, very important for the trusted method chaining, he extended a specific class, for example, abstract set. Okay, back to the PowerPoint. Um, and for the exploitation step, um, James used the same method like Michael in his Reno exploit. He, he was using the Rhino script engine or Reno script engine. And what you can do with this Reno script engine is, is usually you have Java code, 
and from there you call JavaScript code, and from there you can also call again Java code. So this is all done in the Serino script engine. It's in, in script engine from Mozilla. And what he did, he was creating a trusted chain, which was instance in uh, creating the Serino script engine and putting some interesting code in there, and suddenly disabling by using the Serino script engine code to disable the security manager. So detailed steps. We have two drivers implemented. Let's look at the code. We have fake driver one, fake driver two. Fake driver one implements SQL driver. It has a specific prefix to find it later on. You can see it here. This is the, at the starting class. Here we go. It's this code from Metasploit. You say you want to load a JDBC driver which is satisfying this URL and then you do something like driver manager get connection and driver manager get connection then you will reach the vulnerable code uh, the vulnerable code will uh, create this fake drivers and and create and um, disabling the security manager so next steps Um, let's look at the fake driver class. So in the first step, I think it's the best thing which I will de uh, debug to the co uh, through the code. Uh, let's start the exploit. We have we connect. First of all, I need to set a breakpoint here in the beginning. Okay, connect. Now we should go into the debug perspective of Eclipse. Or not. No, no uh, debug perspective. There we go. Okay, that's the wrong exploit. <laughs> Sorry for that. Let's run it. Disconnect. Get the calc. No, we don't want this calc. We would want the other calc. Uh, okay, it's. Sorry, this guy. Okay, and then connect to the debugger. So, again. Now we have to wait again. So what, what is happening now, um, Eclipse is connecting to the JVM, to the debugging interface via socket. Takes some time. Okay. Again, it didn't work, why not? Interesting. Okay, sorry. Oh no, I need to close it. Oh, could work, could work. Doesn't want to, I don't know. Hello. Ah, there we go. Okay, there was it. <laughs> okay, let's close all the instances. Yeah, all closed. Okay, again. Uh, we take the 13 one. We connect with the debugger again. We take this guy. Okay, there we go. Okay, now we can step. Okay, and now you see that the code is executed. We're calling this driver manager get connection class. We step into it. Uh, and now we get into the load initial drivers. First part. Uh, okay, <laughs> now stepped over. And the service loader has already created this classes, 
So for example, the Reno script engine and so on. Now the, the two-string method of all these objects are um, <coughs> called. And what is happening, I think the best way to see that is in this uh, nice picture from James. Um, the service loader class um, will create the driver object, so the one which is specified in the meta inf directory. Um, the fake driver object is created from there. Later on, the abstract set two string method is called on the fake driver object. Then the iterator is called the next method of the iterator, and on the next method uh, and on the and the Reno script engine object is created under a privileged context. Um, I think there's one breakpoint missing here. I want to show it that this Reno object is created. Where is it? Where's the breakpoint? No breakpoint. No. Nope. There you go. So I stepped into. Uh, now we have to decompile it. And we are here. And we see that the constructor of the Reno script engine is loaded. So this object is uh, created. And the funny thing is, um, I already said that um, in this exploit, James was using the Re Reno Rhino exploitation technique. And the fix for, his, for the vulnerability is here. Uh, what they are doing, if this Reno script engine object is created, they are checking if it is coming from an unprivileged context or from a privileged context. Um, and since James construct, uh, constructed this um, trusted method chain, um, you see that this access controller you can step into it. He will return. Oh, no, you don't see it here. Um, he will, will tell. Um, the Reno script engine that it is running under privileged context, and therefore Reno script engine is able to do, let's say, interesting things. So under higher privileges. Uh, back to the PowerPoint. So service loader created the first driver <coughs> object. Then we got this Reno script engine created under a privileged context. And the next step is interesting. Um, the Reno exploitation technique, and that's the same code you can find in the internet. Uh, the second driver is created. And in the second driver, um, and script engine object, or an object of a, the script engine class, is created and this uh, script engine, what you can do with that is you can run JavaScript code in your, in your JVM. I mean, what do you see back? What you see here is what you see here is JavaScript code. And what you do here is you define in, in JavaScript code that, that this proxy object it's a, it's a proxy object between, between the Java world and the JavaScript world. Um, you say that this proxy object has, has, um, has, uh, is an error object, and the error object has uh, an attribute message, and this message is set to the, is, um, and this message can be printed with two string. For example, if the proxy object of this proxy object, the two string method is called, what is happening in the background is this JavaScript code is evaluated and this function is executed. And as I told you in the beginning, um, if, you, if you are able to disable the security manager, it's checkpot. And, and if this code this two string code, so from this proxy object, is running in a privileged context, then the security manager is disabled and you get code execution. And how is this working? Trusted method chaining. Um, again, uh, I think we see it here in the code of the exploit. Uh, back again. 
whenever the driver is loaded from the driver object, the two string at uh, the next method is called. So the driver class or object is got, uh, uh, um, is returned from the iterator, and from this driver object, the two string method is called. And this two string method is the two string method which is disabling the security manager. And if you want to see how the call stack looks like, if the call, um, then let me check where's the explode code. Ooh. Let's run it. Drive and manage uh, exploit. Um, no, we need to run it. So, okay. okay now, and now I got a breakpoint here. I see, okay. Step through, step through, step through, step through. And now you see, okay, the security manager method was, uh, the, um, the, um, the method set security manager uh, or system set security manager was called <coughs> and you got the nice calc. Um, I step very fastly through that. Um, just remember what he was doing. James, uh, he was doing, creating this Reno script engine under a privileged context, um, defining a proxy object with this Reno script engine to call, to, to call a two-string method which has higher privileges. And And if you're interested to build your own exploit for that, just look at me, his homepage. Home page. He tells you how this works. Assign this two-string method, like I showed to you. Create an error object, and get the two-string method called from a, from a privileged class, uh, class or, or object. OK. Um, the next topic is reflection, API abuse. Um, reflection is the preferred way what you can do with reflection, loading classes dynamically. You can also invoke methods dynamically, you can manipulate fields dynamically, and so on. So always at runtime. You can inspect objects, for example, you can go through, with a, through a class, get all the fields, and so on. So you can do, let's say, um, interesting programming stuff. And in Java you have various APIs. The first API is the um, core API, the old one. Uh, you have the la Java lang class method and from there, you, for example, you can call get fields or get method or, and so on. And you have all the classes within Java lang reflect. Um, there's also the new API. It's, um, since Java 7 and all the interesting classes you can find in Java lang invoke. So the vulnerability, which I want to show to you, it's so easy. And it was discovered by Adam of um, security explorations. Um, it was affecting everything, I think it was Java 7, update 7. I think they fixed it in Java 7, update 7, yes, that's right. And um, this exploit was using the method handle object, uh, method handle class. And it's, and, uh, best, uh, the best thing is I want to show you, uh, uh, the best thing is to show you how this method handle class works on an example. Um, let's go here. You have an object x and y, string s and int, and you have method types and method handles. For example, if you want to call the replace method on string, not a typical way, but based on reflection, you can get this method handle uh, lookup class. Um, then you define, okay, I want to find, uh, I want to call a method with the return type string and the arguments character and character and I want to get the method of the string class which is called replace with this method signature like return times st string 
and um, arguments character character. And then I want to invoke this specific method, a method on, on daddy with the arguments d and n. And what is happening then? The method replace is invoked on daddy and d gets it ex uh, replaced through n. So it's interesting, an interesting program style. For example, if you write something like an application server, like WebC or Oracle, Oracle um, WebLogic, there you find a lot of reflection code there because they are always reading XML files, and based on the XML files, they are creating objects <coughs> using reflection. So the nice way to create uh, to replace a string with a lot of code. Uh, so, and the vulnerability which um, Adam found is interesting. <laughs> so, I think you, to find this vulnerability, either you need to look into the code of the JVM, so the native code, or by trying it out. Because what he found out is that when when you invoke the method invoke with arguments, and that's the one which is shown here, invoke with arguments, this is calling the method invoke exact, and this method is only checking the permissions of the immediate caller. Since the immediate caller is invoke with arguments, and invoking arguments is a privileged class. It's coming from rt.jar, which means this class has full permissions. Invoke exact has full permissions, which basically means you can invoke any method you want in Java with all, pri uh, with all privileges. And this is also from the security explorations paper. The possibility to call invoke exact from the system wrapper method bypass of security checked on the immediate caller. And the uh, invoke exact me method, it's a native method. It's, it's not defined in a, in a Java class, it's a native method. That's why I said either he found it by just testing it, uh, testing it or maybe he looked at the JVM code. Uh, so whenever you're able to call this method, you can run any method with full p uh, privileges. Uh, So exploitation is easy. Let's look at the code. Uh, we go to the next exploit, and this this one is much easier. Uh, we see that um, a class, the class definition of a file is read. So just the bytes of b dot class is read, and these are stored in a byte array, which will be used later on. And what in the, in the first step, what he's doing, um, he's creating this method handle lookup class, which is used to get all these method handles. And he's calling the class from the class class the for name method. And if you call the class for name method, you're loading classes. If if you do this with this, uh, with this specific vulnerability, means that you can call, uh, th that uh, you're able to call, or, um, sorry, that you're able to, to load classes, for example, from restricted um, namespaces, like sun dot, because you are not able to, to, uh, to load them usually. Class loader is telling you, you cannot load them, they are from sun, you do not have the rights. But by using this vulnerability, using the method handle, uh, and invoking the invoke with arguments, he's <coughs> able to load the classes Sun Org Mozilla JavaScript internal context. And now the interesting part comes. Generate class loader. And as I told you, if you're able to get a reference to a class loader, and, and if this class loader is not checking, your permissions for the define method. So if you call the define method, you can create your own class with your own privileges. 
and uh, create an object for that and disable the security manager. So now we got classes in our namespace, the context in the generate class loader class. Uh, and in the next steps, he's doing really crazy, crazy things. Um, he's doing this lookup, look up. so the same code, which is here, like method handle lookup, local lookup, equals method handle public lookup, so he's calling the public lookup method, and this public lookup method is returning just a lookup object. He's doing this line of code by using the reflection new API and what he's doing is he's, he's getting from the method handle class the find constructor method and grabbing from the uh, and later on create what is it create uh, create the generated class loader. Let me double check. It's local class one, local class one, method one, method hell one, find virtual, find virtual. And later on, here's where's the invoke with arguments, find virtual here. And later on, here he is creating this generated class loader um, object. And on this object, calling the define class method. And you can read it again in the security explorations paper. If you are able, so if you have the, one, the condition that you can uh, call public, uh, that, that you can call public methods on, on restricted classes, uh, then you just create this Mozilla class loader, call the define class, define your own class there. And in this class, you disable the security manager. And the code for disabling the security manager is here. It's class B, implements privilege, uh, privilege exception, uh, exception action. You see the access controller. This will call the run method, and the run method will disable the security manager. So what we can do is we just set the breakpoint here, run the exploit, and see if we get there. You can also see, and later on, yeah, I think that's, and we can also set here the breakpoint because what is happening here is with the local class new instance. Uh, so the define class will define a new class based on the bytes which are read here. And the, the return type of the define class is the class object, uh, the, the class object, yeah. Uh, and local class three will be uh, instantiated. And th this means an B object will be created under an privilege context. And let's run the exploit. Uh, let me double check. We can step through. <coughs> I think we can step all, uh, skip all the other stuff. Maybe we can put a breakpoint here. Um, OK. Go. We take the 2012. Uh, we do an uh, connect. Hopefully the debugger comes up. Hmm. No debugger, there it is. Okay, we are at the beginning of the exploit. Mm, let's look at the variables. We see the byte array. So what is happening here? Just reading, just reading the bytes of the b.class file in an in a byte array. 
and then all this nice reflection stuff happens. Now we see the forename method handle and let me s check if you can see it here. I will call it and now you should see that local class one uh, local class one is loaded and it's an internal class sun org mozilla javascript internal context so that's the class which we want to have the next step we see that the local class 2 so need some space the generate class loader the class is loaded under privileged context <coughs> and then we go on and on and on and on and later on, let me double check, what does it make sense? Uh, let's step to here. So we call the create class loader. And you see here that at local object two should be uh, one step further. Ah! No, go on. F7. No. We see here that local object 2 is an object of type defining class loader, and that's what we need. We have now a class loader, an object. Yeah. So it's the typical syntax class name, and then add address. And on from this object, we want to call the define class method. Next step. So, and now we run it, and we see after calling the define class method that we have in local class a, a class B. And the class B is exactly the class which we want to have. It's the B one, it's our exploit. Or, or exploit code, which disables the security manager. Uh, and the most interesting thing is now to run this method here, the run method. And this is happening by just creating an B instance. And this will happen, and this will happen, and Sorry, this will ha happen here. We are, we are creating from the B class a new instance. And the new instance is created. The run method, uh, the, the, the run method is executed. And let's, let's double check if this, if this is true. We set a breakpoint here at system set security manager to resume and see we reach the code system set secure calling it with the null parameter and if you have the null parameter we will disable the security manager and the security manager will, will check if, if the class B has the permissions to do that since we defined the class B with our own permissions uh, the, the all permissions we are able to call this method security manager is disabled and the next step is just go back, go back, all this reflection stuff, back, back. And then we see, next step, calc. <coughs> calc. So it's really funny. It's just simple code. Usually if you write it down, but using reflection is not simple, but, but we need to use reflection because to exploit this vulnerability. And the main steps are just get the class loader from Mozilla and and call the create class uh, call the create class loader of the context method and then get the class loader and then call from the class loader the define class with our own privileges and so on um, and the method handle or, or all the new API stuff I think about, let's say, 10, 10 vulnerabilities which Adam found for security uh, explorations. They're all based on similar things like that. 
just invoking specific methods of method handle or other classes from reflection. Okay. Click to play. Uh, who of you has already seen the new click to play features? Hopefully only you, okay. So whenever you run an untrusted applet, for example, if you make your Lohnsteuerausgleich, so your tax, you go there, Elster, and suddenly the Java VM comes up with the new Java 7, whatever version, it will ask you, do you want to run it? Oh no, Elster is assigned applet, it's different, it's different, Elster assigned. But if you, for example, go to Secunia and want to do the Secunia, uh, is your software update, uh, if your software is old or not, check. They have an applet for that, and if this applet is, ru is running, then you would also get this new check from them, and it's asking you, uh, do you want to run this application? Uh, you get this prompt immediately, and just only if you press OK, then it's fine. Uh, and one way of getting around it is <laughs> not to um, to use a serialized applet. And what is a serious applet? If you think about an applet, it's just usually a Java object. What you can do is you take the Java object, write it down on the file system using a specific protocol, which is called serialization, and it's, it's writing a, down the whole object graph, so all the objects which, which are interconnected and all the fields and so on. And uh, Java is offering the possibility to, to run an, uh, an applet based on a serious object. And there was a specific code path in the JRE um, where the security check for this click to play is not done for, ser for a serialized applet. It was pretty easy, and uh, I think it was found by the guy from Immunity, and also by the guy from um, and also from Adam from ex Security Explorations. But this is already fi uh, was already fixed in the next version. So in seven update thirteen, and the newest one is using WebStart, and WebStart is similar. Yeah, it's 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 a technique or a framework where I can either call a Java applet or maybe also an, an, an applica Java application from your browser. And what is happening is an active, ActiveX is starting your applet. You see Java App Start is running and so on. And to bypass the click to play features, you just specify in the JNLP file, and that's the configuration file, which you usually download with the browser. Then Java Web Start comes up. You just specify in a configuration parameter of your applet or application, applet SSV validated true. And then you reach a specific code path in the Java JRE and no click to play. So it won't ask you. And that's still valid, it's still working. And if you look at the Metasploit sources, you still find the newer exploits always started with Java Web Start. But then you do not have any, it's, it's not silent. You always have Java App Start is coming up. And I'm pretty sure that we will see more click to play bypass techniques in the near future. Okay, uh, I think that's it. Uh, questions and answers. And I think Markus told me that we can also do it in German. German, mm. is it right? Mm. So, Fragen. Mm. 